Let's begin last week's updates by discussing the latest news from NASA. On September 20, NASA announced that it had selected a crater near the south pole of the moon as the landing site for the Viper Lunar Robotic Rover. The Volleyball's investigating polar exploration rover, or Viper, will land near the western edge of Nobel Crater near the lunar south pole. Nobel Crater is an impact crater formed through a collision with another smaller celestial body and is almost permanently covered in shadows, allowing ice to exist there. The rover will search for water ice that could be a resource for future human expeditions. The Moon's South Pole is one of the coldest areas in our solar system, and no prior missions to the Moon's surface have explored it. Scientists have thus far only studied the region using remote sensing instruments, including those on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. Data from these and other missions helped scientists conclude that ice and other potential resources exist in permanently shadowed areas near the poles. Viper will launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket in 2023 for delivery to the moon by Astrobotics Griffin Lander, under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services initiative. According to NASA officials, the test flight of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner commercial crew vehicle to the International Space Station is unlikely to occur this year. Engineers are still trying to determine why valves in the propulsion system of the Starliner spacecraft were stuck shut, postponing an uncrewed test flight that had been scheduled for early August. Boeing and NASA teams are currently evaluating whether to put a different service module on Starliner for the mission or to proceed with trying to fix the current one, a decision on that could come in the next few weeks. In addition to addressing the valve issue, the test flight must also find a time when a docking port is available on the International Space Station. According to internal NASA schedules there are two such opportunities this year, the entire month of October and the period between November 12 and December 1. On the other hand, Starliner and its Atlas V rocket appear unlikely to be ready for either of those launch windows. Also, because Axiom's private mission to the space station on a SpaceX Crew Dragon has been postponed until late February, Starliner will be able to fly to the space station from January 3 to February 22 of the next year. At this point, that appears to be the best-case scenario for the test flight. On September 19, NASA successfully completed the Space Launch System rocket's umbilical release and retract test inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. The umbilicals were designed to provide power, communications, coolant, and fuel to the rocket and the Orion spacecraft while at the launch pad until they disconnect and retract at ignition and liftoff. The 115-meter mobile launcher features a metal tower atop a two-story base with six swing arms that will retract away from the rocket before launch. The umbilical release and retract test validated how the connections between the rocket and its mobile launch tower rotate or retract during liftoff. Several umbilical arms were extended during the test to connect the space launch system rocket and the mobile launcher. Then they swung away from the rocket, just as they will on launch day. According to NASA, teams will continue conducting tests inside the vehicle assembly building before transporting the Orion spacecraft to the assembly building and stacking it atop the SLS, completing assembly of the rocket for the Artemis 1 mission. Rocket Lab announced that it had signed a dedicated launch contract with Astroscale, a market leader in satellite servicing and long-term orbital sustainability. Scheduled for liftoff from Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1 in 2023, the Electron rocket will launch the active debris removal by Astroscale Japan satellite, which has been selected by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, for phase one of its commercial removal of debris demonstration project, one of the world's first technology demonstrations of removing large-scale debris from orbit. Once deployed to a precise orbit by Electron's kick stage, the satellite will rendezvous with a piece of orbital debris, an abandoned upper stage rocket body. The satellite aims to demonstrate proximity operations and obtain images of the rocket body, delivering observational data to better understand the debris environment. Rendezvousing with a piece of debris on orbit, traveling at around 27,000 km per hour, is a highly complex task that requires absolute precision. A planned second phase of the mission intends to demonstrate the deorbit of the debris. Astroscale performed the first release and capture of a client spacecraft on August 25, deploying the small spacecraft from the main one and then recapturing it using a magnetic mechanism. A series of more complex tests, including attempting to capture the client while tumbling, is scheduled for the next several months. The ability to actively remove satellites and debris from orbit at the end of their operational life will likely play a key role in ensuring a sustainable space environment for the future. Geostationary satellite communications startup, Astronus, has decided to move its first operational satellite launch from a SpaceX Falcon 9 to a Falcon Heavy. 
Astronus manufacture and operate a line of micro-geo spacecraft for regional broadband and broadcast services. With a proven digital processing capability at the heart of its payload, the Astronus Micro-Geo can provide affordable, high-speed broadband internet that is perfectly targeted to any geography around the world. Micro-Geo satellites are designed for geostationary orbits approximately 36,000 kilometers above Earth's surface, more than 60 times higher than SpaceX's Starlink constellation. However, like Starlink satellites, Micro-Geo will feature exceptional throughput per kilogram, weighing a magnitude less than average modern geostationary communications satellites, while still offering up to 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Launching as a secondary payload on the Viasat-3 mission in spring 2022, the 400 kg Aurora 4A Micro-Geo satellite will arrive at its orbital slot within days of liftoff, removing the need for months of orbit raising from highly elliptical geostationary transfer orbit. Falcon Heavy is scheduled to carry two classified payloads for the U.S. Space Force in separate missions before the Astronus mission. NASA's InSight lander has detected its three most powerful Marsquakes yet, potentially giving scientists an even clearer picture of the red planet's interior. The interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy and heat transport, or the InSight lander, touched down near the Martian equator in November 2018, tasked with probing the planet's interior like never before. The solar-powered lander's main science instruments are a burrowing heat probe and a supersensitive suite of seismometers. Insight Seismometer, the seismic experiment for interior structure, is a dome-shaped instrument that sits on the Martian surface and takes the pulsar seismic vibrations of Mars. The vibration waves change as they travel through a planet's interior, providing scientists a way to peer deep below the surface. What they learn can shed light on how all rocky worlds form, including Earth and its moon, InSight spotted 4.2 and 4.1 magnitude temblers on August 25, then picked up another roughly 4.2 magnitude quake on September 18 that lasted for nearly 90 minutes. The previous record holder, which InSight measured in 2019, clocked in at magnitude 3.7, about five times less powerful than a 4.2 magnitude quake. The InSight team is still studying the September 18 quake, but mission researchers have already characterized the August 25 events to some degree. For example, they've determined that the 4.2 magnitude Tembler originated about 8,500 kilometers from InSight, and the 4.1 magnitude Tembler occurred much closer to the lander, around 925 kilometers away. Previous analysis of these kinds of Temblers has allowed the InSight team to map out the Martian interior in detail. For example, the lander's observations have revealed that the red planet has a surprisingly large core and relatively thin crust. The newly detected Marsquakes could help sharpen this picture. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Pre-launch works on Booster 4 and Starship 20 are continuing at SpaceX's launch site in Starbase, Texas. The Raptor vacuum engine which was installed on the ship two weeks ago was removed and moved to the build site on September 19. Ship 20 now consists of two sea-level Raptors and zero vacuum engines. The thrust simulator for the ship was transported to the launch site on September 24. The hydraulic pistons of the thrust simulator will press against the base of the vehicle to mimic the force of the Raptor engines during cryo-proof tests without actually igniting the engines. This newly delivered thrust simulator is designed to mimic the force exerted by the three inner sea level engines of the ship. A thrust simulator for the vacuum engines of the ship was also transported to the launch site the same day. At the time of making this video, road closures are scheduled from Monday to Wednesday possibly for ship 20 ground tests. When the road was closed on September 20, the orbital launch tower quick disconnect arm extension was transported to the launch site on a self-propelled modular transporter. The extension was lifted and attached to the end of the tower's newly installed quick disconnect arm three days later. The arm extension has a claw-like structure for bracing booster to steady the vehicle during Starship stacking. Aside from a bit of plumbing and wiring, the only thing that now seems to be missing from the arm is the actual quick disconnect umbilical panel that will allow it to temporarily connect to starships to deliver power, propellant, and connectivity. That quick disconnect mechanism will likely sit directly on top of the brand new claw. Once the ship is firmly installed on top of the booster, the claw's missing quick disconnect mechanism will move in to connect to the ship. Works on the booster catching arm are also nearing completion at the launch site. Moreover, all the four extensions of the booster catching arm carriage were put together two weeks ago. On Saturday, SpaceX connected Super Heavy Booster 4 to a giant crane and then lifted and removed the vehicle from the orbital launch mount to facilitate catching arm installation and movement check on the tower. The crane then gently lowered the booster onto the booster hold down stand. 
The booster will stay attached to the stand until SpaceX employees complete the installation of the catching arm on the launch tower. The quick disconnect arm umbilical panel may also be installed before placing the booster back on the launch mount. Booster removal from the orbital launch mount simply means that the booster's cryo-proof and static fire tests will be further delayed. Meanwhile, the Federal Communications Commission granted SpaceX authorization to test its Starlink Internet network during the debut orbital flight test. SpaceX's objective is to demonstrate high data rate communications with Starship and the Super Heavy booster during the test flight. For the first time since Blue Origin took NASA to federal court after losing a moon lander contract to Starship and a protest over that loss, the U.S. Federal Court of Claims released a redacted version of the lawsuit by Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin. NASA inexplicably disregarded key flight safety requirements for only SpaceX in order to select and make award to a SpaceX proposal that NASA's evaluation team assessed as tremendously high risk and immensely complex, even before the waiver of safety requirements, Blue Origin said in the lawsuit filed in August. Blue Origin argued that SpaceX's Starship moon lander proposal is extremely complex and NASA is taking an undeniable risk by choosing SpaceX. Nevertheless, NASA made it abundantly clear in the public selection statement that SpaceX's proposal was by far the most competent, offering a far superior management approach and technical risk no worse than Blue Origin's far smaller and drastically less capable lander. The core of Blue Origin's argument is that NASA ignored a requirement that bidders include a flight readiness review before the launch of each element of the lander systems. Blue Origin alleges that SpaceX did not include flight readiness reviews before each tanker Starship launch carrying propellant to fuel the lander Starship. Failure to meet that requirement was a deficiency that Blue Origin argues should have disqualified SpaceX from an HLS award. But in a tweet, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk rejected the claims about flight readiness reviews. In short, Blue Origin seeks to entirely suspend the HLS contract award and payments, allow revisions to proposals, and make a new selection. Moving on to other Starship updates, two days after a group of tanker trucks loaded with cryogenic liquid nitrogen began to arrive at the Starship launch site, the company's custom-built tank farm seems to have taken its first breath. On September 21, at least one of seven massive propellant storage tanks began venting to facilitate pressure maintenance during operations with cryogenic fluids. When cryoliquids are loaded into empty tanks, they inevitably come into contact with the hot pipes and tank walls, causing a portion of the liquid to heat up rapidly and boil into gas. That extra gas needs to be released to prevent the tanks from exploding. In short, SpaceX has begun testing and activating part of its brand new Starship tank farm, beginning with much less risky liquid nitrogen-proof testing. Meanwhile, post-installation works on the remaining ground support equipment tanks are progressing rapidly. The crew access ports on the sides of the unsleeved tanks were sealed recently, indicating that the works in the interior of these tanks were completed. Later on September 24, GSE tank No. 1 designed to store cryogenic liquid nitrogen was sleeved with a custom-built cryo shell. Works on the GSE tank No. 8 are now complete, and the tank is now ready to be taken to the launch site. This will be the last GSE tank to be installed at the tank farm. During a recent aerial flyover, RGV aerial photography spotted the forward flaps of Starship 21 completely covered with thermal protection tiles lying at the build site. Works on the nose cone and the oxygen tank section of Ship 21 are progressing inside the factory tents. The United States Space Force recently announced that it had awarded SpaceX a $14.47 million contract to work on a prototype project to develop Starship's Raptor engine. The award announcement specifically states that, under the contract, SpaceX will conduct a series of tests, namely, Raptor rapid throttling and restart testing, liquid methane specification development and testing, and combustion stability analysis and testing of Raptor engines. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.